Oh Lord Jesus, what a powerful name you have. And we thank you, Lord, that you are our Redeemer. You are also the Lord of hosts. You are with us all the time. We ask that you would speak to us, continue to speak to us through your word. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. For a number of years we lived in Lebanon, just north of Israel, and uh, we enjoyed walking uh, around Einzahalter, up in the mountains and other areas. And we would come across little, uh, almost circles of um, bricks, and um, it wasn't a full circle, not very high, but we learned these were uh, built, put there by the shepherds, the young shepherds, and uh, they would lie across the opening. They would actually be the door of these little sheep folds. It was amazing, really. And this is, uh, was in the mind of Jesus when he said in John chapter 10, talking about himself being the good shepherd, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. I'm going to talk this morning about walls and ways. <clears throat> There's a, a marvellous construction in China, the Great Wall of China. I don't know if any of you have seen it. I've actually uh, seen it. And uh, it was first built between 220 and 206 BC. And then there was an extension to it in 1368 and 1644 AD. And it still stretches across hundreds of miles of rugged mountainous terrain. It's only um, one of the few man-made objects visible from space. It's quite amazing, really, if you look at the top there. That's the wall of China. It was built for one purpose, and that was to keep out the barbarians bent on destroying Chinese civilization. And it worked for quite a while, but eventually the enemies succeeded. They found a gatekeeper who was of weak character, and they bribed him into leaving his gate unlocked. And that's what happened in China. The Great Wall wasn't all that effective. Actually, until we come to Christ, there's a wall between us and God. We read in Isaiah 50 verse 2, Your iniquities or your sins have made a separation between you and God. <clears throat> but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man comes to the Father but through me. He's actually made a way for us. If we come to him, receive his forgiveness, then we have access to the Father and that wall is no, is no longer there <clears throat> between us. We read in 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died for our sins once and for all to bring us to God. <clears throat> Our lives are really like that great wall in some way, strong and fortified at some points and vulnerable at other points. We will always be attacked where we are the weakest. In Proverbs 4.23 we read above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. A chain is only as strong as the weakest link. And so is our character. God wants to change us, both on the inside and the outside. And this is why Paul said, Do not offer your, the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer the parts of your body to him 
as instruments of righteousness. He also wrote, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Both our bodies and our minds need to be committed to Christ for only then he, begin, he can begin changing us to be the people he wants us to be. It's God's will that we should be set apart for him. We're always a reflection of our thoughts. Our thoughts determine our actions. And God is concerned about what's going on inside of us as well as what's going on outside of us. Many centuries ago, a man called Gregory the Great, he categorised our enemies as being pride, anger, envy, impurity, gluttony, slothfulness, slothfulness and greed. I want to look at just three of these, actually. It's no secret that he mentioned pride first, for self-centred pride is at, the re is at the root of almost every sin. And the Bible warns us, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before, the f before we fall. Pride blinds us of our faults. A prideful, self-righteous person is, the, uh, is in one of Jesus' stories where that person prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Nearby, another man was praying in Luke 18, but he had a humble attitude and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus tells us that God heard this prayer. He heard the prayer of the humble man. Pride cuts us off from others and it's the root of all prejudice and racism. And we're told that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Perhaps Nebuchadnezzar was one of the mightiest pagan kings in history. In history. He's still venerated today in Iraq and was the hero of Iraq's previous ruler, Saddam Hussein. Nebuchadnezzar broke the power of Egypt. In 605 BC, Egypt was a mighty nation, but Nebuchadnezzar broke its power. He crushed rebellions in Palestine. He took King Jehoiachin and many captives to Babylon, among them the prophet Ezekiel, and he also took Daniel, Daniel of the lion's den. And we're told in scripture that <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar called on the God of Daniel. However, in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, we read of Nebuchadnezzar's self-glorifying pride. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar said. Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence for the might of my power and for the glory of of my majesty. He didn't realise that God was listening to every word he said. While he was still speaking, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty has been removed from you and you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle. And seven years will pass until you recognise that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. That's Daniel 4, verses 31 and 32. It is documented in other writings that he had this period of insanity for seven years. His hair and nails grew. However... At the end of that period, he was able to say, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raise my eyes towards heaven. My reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. We listened, we, listening to these words of the pagan king, he continued to say, 
I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt and honour the King of Heaven for all his works are true, <clears throat> his ways are just and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Saddam Hussein regarded himself as being the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. He was very proud and very cruel, <clears throat> but he ended up hiding under the ground and living like an animal. And when he was found by the Americans, his hair was long and matted. His nails were like claws. He had a similar fate to Nebuchadnezzar, but he never repented and uh, he stood trial at Camp Justice and was hung. And we read in Micah 6, 8, What does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Does this mean that pride is wrong? No, it isn't really. We can take pride in a job well done or in an accomplishment of those we love as long as we ultimately acknowledge that it is God who gives abilities and he ultimately deserves the credit. As we recognise how great God is, then there's not much room for boasting. We're told in Romans 12 too, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. And then Paul urged the Ephesian Christians to get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. It's not wrong to be angry. We can be angry at injustice. But God is, God is angry and grieved when his righteousness is scorned. And Jesus forcefully drove out from the temple those who were callously making money from God's people. I don't think he would have had a smile on his face while he was doing it. However, we need to discern between righteous indignation and our own lovelessness and self-righteousness. Bitterness, hatred and jealousy and resentment are all closely related. Bitterness is anger turned sour. It's an attitude of deep discontent that poisons souls and destroys peace. Ruth Graham has said, a bitter, sour Christian is one of Satan's trophies. See to it that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defiles many. Are anger and bitterness keeping you from being the person God wants you to be? I can guarantee it will rob you of joy or that sense of well-being. I hear Christians who are hurt by their children and many of us have been hurt by our children. However, this has allowed a bitter, a bitter, pitiful spirit to control them. You cannot be pitiful and powerful at the same time. You can't keep keeping sorry for your, feeling sorry for yourself. However, if Jesus is Lord of our life, we cannot dwell in that place. We must forgive. If you can't do this, find someone that you can trust and pray with them. There is a sentence in the Lord's Prayer that many of us overlook. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Jesus also said, if you don't forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. While we're nursing bitterness, our prayers will be hindered. I can assure you that the Lord can change the heart of those children or of that person who's hurt us, but he can also change our heart too. The Oxford Dictionary defines greed as an excessive desire for food or wealth. It's one of those corrupt guards that sit at the door of our heart. We don't hear greed spoken of very often. However, most of you will be familiar with that 
uh, popular line of restaurant Sizzlers that is now in non-existent. I was surprised that Sizzlers lasted so long <laughs> because you notice that people paid their money and then they just went and filled their plates and kept go ba going back and filling them and then food was being wasted and children were allowed to do the same thing. My husband and I were invited to a leader's lunch at a, a sporting venue in Brisbane. Food was laid out, there was plenty of food and uh, we had to line up in a queue and we were probably halfway down the queue. But the men ahead of us just piled their plates they didn't just take one or two prawns, they take ten, they took ten prawns, twelve, plus so much more. When it came to us, there was hardly anything left. So we took a little. Uh, but then the thirty or forty people behind us got little and little until there was none left. And so there were many people at that lunch that got that went without because the host said that was all the food. And I felt ashamed because we represented Christ. But those men represented Christ and they took no thought of those who were behind them. And so gluttony is rife. We're told in Proverbs 23, 21, the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty. You may have heard of Janet Holmes Accord. She's a millionaire who lives in Western Australia. Someone said to her, it must be wonderful to have so much wealth. But she wisely replied, I can only eat three meals a day and I can only wear one dress at a time. I have put most of my wealth into trust to help the less fortunate than me. A very wise lady. Judas was controlled by greed and betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He was later remorseful, but sadly took his own life. Ananias and Sapphira were in the early church. They uh, were caught up in the... Um, marvellous um, activity of bringing their goods to help the poor and um, they sold a plot of land and they pretended that the money they brought uh, was all of the money. They kept quite a bit for themselves and Peter being led by the Holy Spirit recognised this and asked them and uh, they had to confess actually that they were lying to God and both Ananias and Sapphira died instantly. Um, God takes a very dim, group, dim view of greed. Jesus said, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And ask God to show you if greed has gripped your heart and confess it and repent it. Otherwise it can destroy you and make you useless for the kingdom. I remember visiting someone not far from here who felt they couldn't afford to give any money to the Lord. They came to this church, but they had quite a number of pets and they spent quite a lot of money on pet food. Uh, but they couldn't, or the word is wouldn't, set money aside to help a fellow human being or to commit to the ministry of a church. Jesus talks about uh, a lovely elderly woman who was putting money in the um, treasury box and he noted, he said, she, he saw her heart and he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she owned, all that she has lived on, can live on.
Finally, I'd just like to uh, talk about God's grace in helping us to live the way we need to live. There's saving grace and sustaining grace. God's undeserved favour coming to us, drawing us to himself. But we forget that he also pours out his grace upon us, which includes his strength and ability uh, to help us live the way we ought to live. Paul writes, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And this power comes with his grace. John Newton, many of you know, uh, was a, a slave trader who wrote the words, Amazing Grace. John had a praying mother who prayed for him through all those years that he was bringing slaves to be sold in the UK. And he says from his diary, it is written, or oh, somebody read his diary and said it's written that on the day his beloved Mary died, John Newton's wife, he found the strength to preach a Sunday sermon. The next day he visited church members and later on officiated at her funeral. Looking back, he wrote, the bank of heaven is too poor to compensate for a loss as mine. But the Lord all-sufficient speaks, and it is done. Let all those who know him and trust him be of good courage. He can give them strength according to the day. He can increase their strength as the trials increase. And what he can do, he has promised he will do. And he will do for you and me. I want to just read uh, these few lines that are on John Newton's tombstone. George Beverly Shea memorised them and I heard him uh, repeat these words and I thought how, how good they were. This is what it says on his tombstone. Once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the mercy of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ preserved, restored, pardoned and appointed to preach the faith he had long laboured to destroy. We're going to sing Amazing Grace.